Hi, I'm going to do a review for the second half of Physics AB. This is, would be the beginning of a Physics B exam review. Now I'm going to go fast. I talk fast, but you can stop this and replay it or slow it down, uh, whatever works for you. Um, please print out the equation sheet now. You can find it on the class resources page. Print it out. Use it as you review if you haven't done this already. Make notes on it. Add equations to it. Um, put sample problems on it, whatever you can. This is a live link. Uh, it will not show as live in the video, however. Um, but it is, go to the class resources page and you'll see the link there. Open it, print it out uh, so that you can use it on your exam. Use it as you study, as you prepare, and use it on the exam. First question, if you double the mass of a moving object at kinetic energy, will or if you double the velocity of a moving object, kinetic energy will. Well, let's look at the equation for kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is one half mv squared. So it's directly proportional to the mass and directly proportional to the square of the velocity. Because kinetic energy and mass are directly proportional, if I double the mass, I will double the kinetic energy. So kinetic energy will double. But if I double the velocity, it's velocity squared. So it's like doubling it twice. So you have a 1 half m. And if I multiply v by 2, it's 2v squared. And 2v squared is, parentheses, is 4v squared. OK, so see, you get a factor of 4. Um, if I double the velocity. So kinetic energy will be multiplied by 4 or be quadrupled. OK. Uh, doing work on an object. Doing work on an object will increase the energy of the object being worked on. It will decrease the energy of the object doing the work. So if you lift a box, from the floor up to a high shelf, you're doing work. You're going to increase the energy of the box. You will be doing work on the box. And you yourself will decrease in energy because you are doing work. Work is a scalar quantity. Quantity Enter Energy is a scalar quantity. Work can have a plus or minus sign, but that's not directional. Positive work increases the energy of something. Negative work decreases the energy of something. But uh, that is not directional. Um, work is a scalar quantity. It has magnitude. It has no direction. If there's a force at an angle to the displacement, only the component of the force that is in the direction of the motion does work. So if I have a box and I push that box up this incline, let's make it a frictionless incline so that I'm only working against gravity. Uh, I will do is just the same amount of work as if I pick this box up from here and move it to there. It's only the component uh, that is of the force that is in the direction of the motion. So if I'm working against gravity, gravity works this way. And if I'm exerting a force this way, only the vertical component of that force is actually going to be doing work against gravity. Okay? That's why the formula is FD cosine theta. It's FD if the force and the direction are in the same uh, direction because the cosine of, of zero, a zero angle, is one. Um, and it's negative if the direction and the force are in opposite directions because the cosine of 180 is a negative one. How much work is done if a 50 newton force is applied on an object in the direction of the motion? while the object slides across the floor. So um, here's my box. I'm going to apply a force acting in this direction. And it's going to move in a direction uh, that is also um, to the right in this diagram. And it's going to slide a direction of 3 meters, exerting a 50 newton force. So if I do FD cosine theta, well, just like I said just a second ago, the angle between the force and the direction here is 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. That's just Fd. And so that's 50 newtons times 3 meters is 150 joules. Opposite the direction, it's the same 
I have this box. Um, work is done. Opposite to direction of motion. So that'd be like, suppose this box were already sliding this way, and I exerted a force in that way direction to slow it down, and I had to exert that force for a distance of three meters before it came to a stop. Um, then uh, F D cosine theta. But now the angle between the direction of the motion or the displacement and the force is 180, and the cosine of 180 degrees is negative 1. So I get the same FD times negative 1. So it'd be one, negative 150 joules. Again, that doesn't mean that energy and work are vector quantities. They are scalar quantities, but you can't have positive or negative work. Uh, this, you come, this issue comes up in other problems as well. Remember that opposite the direction of motion means that the work is negative. A ball was thrown by moving it through a 20 meter long, I mean, two meter long arc. So I have a distance of two meters while doing 3.5 joules of work. Um, what is the force that was applied to the ball? Well, remember the work energy. There, no, work is force times distance, sorry. Work is force times distance. And so if I'm looking for the force, force is going to be equal to work divided by the distance. So 3.5 joules divided by 2 meters equals 1.75. 3.5 divided by 2 equals 1.75 newtons. A block uh, has 10 joules of work done on it, so there's my work, while it is pushed a distance of 2.5 meters across the floor. What is the force acting on the block? So okay, force is work divided by distance again. So 10 joules divided by 2.5 meters is 4 newtons. I'm going to look these over real quick because I'm not sure why I put two on here that were so similar. A ball is thrown by moving it, so there's my distance, and uh, there's my work. Okay. Uh, a rock with a mass of 10 kilograms falls, so there's mass. All, falls a distance of 25 meters to the ground. What is the work done by the gravitational force? This is tricky. Uh, if the weight of the ball is 98 newtons, okay, so it's work is force times distance. The uh, gravity will be exerting the weight of the ball. Uh, that's the force that gravity is exerting um, through that distance of 25 meters. So uh, work is going to be force which is 98 newtons times um, the distance, which is 25 meters. So 98 times 25 is 2,450 joules. Now I need to check and make sure that, okay, um, be careful because if you lifted this box, you would do um, 2,450 joules of work on it if you lifted it with a constant speed, a distance of 25 meters. And in that case, the gravitational force would be doing negative work because you would be lifting it while gravity acts downward. But in this case, the rock falls, so that's downward, and the gravitational force is downward, so the angle between the two is zero, and that's the answer. What is the kinetic energy of a six kilogram toy car that is going um, at 1.75 meters per second across the floor? Uh, kinetic energy is one half mv squared. So one half times six kilograms times 1.75 meters per second squared. So 1.75 times six. And then divide that by two. And I get 5.25 joules. Now remember, the questions that I'm answering are the most missed questions from uh, the tests and exams 
that cover this material. And so uh, I'm not sure why this one was tricky, but um, a lot of people must have missed it or I wouldn't have put it in this presentation. A three kilogram toy car has 25 joules of kinetic energy. What's the magnitude of the velocity? There are a lot of questions on the exam that require you to rearrange equations. So if kinetic energy is one half mv squared, velocity is the square root of two times the kinetic energy divided by the mass. Uh, multiply both sides by two and you get a two on the side and then divide both sides by m and then take the square root. And so that's the square root of two times 25 over three. So two times 25 is 50 divided by three. 16.67 <clears throat> and then take the square root of that and I get 4.1 per second. A 45 kilogram kid on a skateboard has, I left a word out here, has 35 joules of kinetic energy. How fast is he going? Okay, that's the same question as this one. What is the velocity? How fast? And again, rearranging uh, the equation, I'll get this one again. I don't need to go through that. And so the velocity is the square root of 2 times 35 over 45. 2 times 35 divided by 45. And then take the square root of that. I'm going to get 1.25. Meters per second. Okay. How much work is done on the object as it moves from six meters to nine meters? Okay, so here's our displacement. So it's going to move from six meters to nine meters. And this is a force times displacement graph. And the work then is equal to the area between the plotted curve and the horizontal axis. And so in this case, it would be this area here. And the area is a triangle. So it's going to be one half the base of that triangle times its height. So one half the base is from six to nine is three. And the height, it goes from zero to 60, right? 60, and 60 times 3 is 180, and half of that is 90 joules. This is a very typical question. Um, they can put the same graph. They will. The same graph is on there with different uh, areas that you have to find. If you're asked to find between 9 and 10, then you would just find the area of this rectangle. If you're asked uh, between 2 and 5, you'd be finding the area of this rectangle this right here. Um, if you're asked to find between like 0 and 5, you'd have to find the area of this triangle and the area of this rectangle and add them together. The same graph will be on there with different sections that you'll have to find the area of. But work is the area between the plotted curve and the axis of a force displacement graph. The value of gravitational energy, gravitational potential energy is always measured from the center of the Earth. No. Depends only on the height above the Earth's surface. No, maybe. Can vary depending on the zero point. I think that's the right answer. Is fixed for a specific height. No, because it's mgh or mgy, uh, and so it depends on the mass as well. So it's no, it's not ever measured from the center of the Earth? Well, I guess it could be, but typically we use a reference point. Remember, that's the point of this problem. Is you set your reference point, and it doesn't depend on the height above the Earth's surface. It depends on the height above our zero point or our reference point. So that's the answer. What is the value of gravitational potential energy of a 15 kilogram object that is five meters above the ground relative to a point eight meters. Okay, so here's the ground. Our reference point is up here. 
eight meters up here. The object is five meters high here at five meters. This is eight, this is five. So it, it's below the reference level and so it's going to have a negative potential energy. It's this distant difference in height. So it is um, the final height minus the initial height is negative three. So it's three units below, that's what the negative would be, three units below the reference level. And so when we're calculating the gravitational potential energy, we would say MGH, mass times 9.8 times negative 3. So 15 times 9.8 times negative 3 is negative 441, and that's the answer. You would be in good shape if you used 10 for G. Uh, your answer won't be exactly right, but it'll be close. So if you'd use 10, you could, um, 150, I mean, 15 times 10 is 150, times 3 is 445, and it's negative, and this is the only one that's close to negative 445. I use 10 when I'm working out problems um, just because it's so much easier. How much energy is stored in a spring? Now remember, elastic potential energy is 1 half kx squared, where k is the spring constant, and x is the uh, distance through which it's compressed or stretched. Um, so we have 1 half k in this problem is 725 and x squared 0 0.650 squared. My calculator, 0 0.65 squared times 725, and then divide that by 2. I get 153, and it's energy, so it's joules, and there we go. A state function, this is just some vocabulary stuff that are facts that you need to know. A state function is independent of the way something gets to a place. The path, it is independent of the path. An example of something that is a state function is gravitational potential energy. Basically, in order to be a state function, it has to be something that has potential energy associated with it. Um, so gravitational potential energy, electrical potential energy, elastic potential energy. Um, but none of these uh, is the answer. Friction is a, a non-conservative force, which we haven't talked about during this review, but you should know about it. And you only have a state function if it is uh, a function that it deals with a conservative force like gravity, not friction. So basically, if you see friction in there, no, it's not, it's not a state function. The exception to the law of conservation of energy occurs in any of these cases. Um, and it's, it's, there's a bigger law, the law of conservation of mass and energy, in which none of these would be a violation. But if you're strictly looking at the law of conservation of energy, because some energy gets converted to or from mass in each of these cases, um, energy is, is not conserved mass and energy is. And there's another thing down here that you can't really see. The law of conservation of energy can be applied under normal circumstances. Perhaps I should slide this down so that that shows. Hold on a second. There we go. Okay. So look for that. The law of conservation can be applied. That would be a good beginning to a multiple choice. Uh, no, here. And then under normal circumstances. A conservative force is one where the path does not affect the work done and results in conservation of energy. Gravity is a conservative force. Force applied against gravity, like lifting something, would be conservative. The spring force is conservative. Friction is not. For energy to be conserved, as a box slides down a slope, so you have an incline with a box on it, and the box is sliding down the slope, um, for energy to be conserved, um, friction cannot be present because friction is a non-conservative force. And so if friction were here, it would be taking energy out of the system and energy would not be conserved. The box must speed up. Well, there's, uh, yes, because gravity is the force that's acting on it. And so, yeah, um, so friction cannot be present. That's true. 
the box has to speed up. If gravity is the only thing that's acting, it would be accelerating the block down the incline. The energy due to the height is all converted to energy of motion. Well, by the time it gets to the bottom, it would be. So all of the uh, gravitational potential energy here, energy due to height, would be con converted to kinetic energy when the box got to the bottom. And so, yes, all of these are true. Power is work divided by time. It is the rate of doing work or the rate of converting energy. Uh, momentum and impulse. So we're moving into the second uh, unit uh, uh, module for uh, physics B. What would make an elastic collision not perfectly elastic? Kinetic energy not being conserved. That's the big difference between an elastic and an inelastic collision. Even if things bounce off of each other, which is what a lot of students think elastic collision means, they can bounce, but if energy is lost, if kinetic energy, specifically kinetic energy is lost, it is not a perfectly elastic collision. An inelastic collision is one in which um, Okay, it would not be one where they bounce. In an inelastic collision, uh, energy is not conserved. In elastic collisions, they are. This is the nonsense answer because we've never learned anything about things flexing. And yes, in an inelastic collision, objects stick together. Now, you can have, uh, a, that would be a perfectly inelastic collision. You can have degrees of uh, it's kind of like a spectrum with elastic at one end and inelastic at the other. If kinetic energy is not conserved, whether they stick together or not, it is not a perfectly elastic collision. Two objects with momentum values of 50 kilogram meters per second and negative 75 kilogram meters per second collide elastically. After the collision, the first object has momentum of negative 40. What is the momentum of the second? Well, it didn't even have to be an elastic collision because momentum has to be conserved. So the total momentum uh, before the initial momentum has to be equal to the final momentum. The initial momentum is 50 and negative 50 plus negative 75 or negative 25. And so the final momentum is negative 40 plus something, let's give it a big x, and so to solve this, if negative 25 is negative 40 plus x, I add 40 to both sides, and I get x equals uh, positive 40 and 25 is 15, so 15 kilogram meters per second. So the elastically, we didn't even care. Uh, because momentum is conserved even in, in elastic collisions. A meteorite with momentum of 1,700 kilogram meters per second breaks into two pieces. One continues forward with a momentum of 2,300 kilograms, which is the velocity of the other piece if it has a mass of 25. Again, initial momentum equals final momentum. Total initial momentum equals total final. So I have initial momentum of 1,700 uh, and that has to equal the sum of the other two momenta. So 2300 plus the missing momentum. Subtract 2300. And 1700 minus 2300 is negative 600. And that is equal to the mass times the velocity of this other piece. And it has a velocity of 25 kilograms. So if negative 600 equals 25 kilograms times the velocity, divide both sides by 25 kilograms, and 600 divided by 25 is 24. So the velocity is, now it's, remember this negative here? Um, negative 600 divided by 25 will be negative um, 24 meters per second. So it's that answer. Two skaters push off, one heads to the right. Okay, so the initial momentum is zero. And so their momenta have to add to be zero. So zero equals one heads off to the right with momentum of 85 kilogram meters per second and one heads to the left. Um, 
Oh, wait a minute. It doesn't say that they're stationary. So, sorry. We don't know the initial momentum. So, the initial momentum is 85 plus negative 65, or you could just say minus 65. But when I say the total or sum of, I like to add things together. So, 85 minus 65 is 20, positive 20. And so, since the final momentum is 20, the initial momentum has to be 20 as well. And the final momentum is positive, so the initial momentum had to be positive. How much time would it take to stop a 2.75 kilogram ball traveling at 3.9 meters per second if a constant force uh, is applied to it? Okay, so we have the uh, momentum impulse formula. So force times time equals mass times change in velocity. To stop a, okay, so we're going to have initial velocity of um, delta V is a final minus the initial. So the final velocity is zero, and so the change in velocity is negative 3.9 meters per second. Um, if I need to know the time, time is mass times change in velocity over the force equals 2.75 times negative 3.9 divided by negative, see so this force is being, right, it gave you a sign right there, negative 5 newtons, so it'll come out to be positive. So 2.75 times 3.9, and divide that by 5, I get 2.145. So there we go, seconds. Um, writing Newton's second law in terms of momentum allows us to deal with a change in mass and a change in velocity. If we just think about just momentum, uh, then, or I'm sorry, if we just think about Newton's second law, F equals ma, then there's our change in velocity. But if we rewrite it in terms of momentum, then uh, we can deal with both mass and velocity changing. So if the force on an object is constant, as a mass is decreased, then the velocity increases. So if momentum is conserved, and momentum is mass times velocity. Um, if the force is constant, then as mass goes is decreased, then velocity has to increase to keep the product constant. Okay, there are a number of questions that are variations on this theme. Some have the whole chart. Um, filled and you have to determine if it's a perfectly elastic collision or not. Others tell you it's perfectly elastic and you have to find a missing piece like this one. Um, determine the value of the missing data point. So uh, we have initial kinetic energy here. If we add those, the total initial kinetic energy is 9 and 14, which is, or here's 14.06, 20. 3.06 joules. The final kinetic energy has to be equal to 23.06 because it's perfectly elastic and so we know that the total of these and the total of these have to equal. So 23.06 equals 21.34 plus something. Subtract 21.34 from both sides. 23.06 minus 21.34, and I get 1.72 joules. So that's what would go there. Again, there are there are variations. Uh, the other common one is all of the values are filled in, and you have to determine if it is perfectly elastic. And then you would add up these two, and add up these two, and see, are they equal? And if they're not, then it's not perfectly elastic, and if they are, it is. A crate has momentum decreased by 3.62 kilogram meters per second by a force of 5.31 that opposes its motion. How long does it take? And this is the impulse momentum theorem we used uh, on a previous problem. Uh, so if I want time, the time is going to be equal to mass times change of velocity over the force. And that equals 
um, well, we don't need, okay, the momentum is decreased. So the change in momentum, this is change in momentum. Um, and so the change in momentum is 3.62 kilogram meters per second divided by a force of 5.31. Calculator, 3.62 divided by 5.31. Equals 0 0.68 seconds. Okay, the Doppler effect is one of those problems that are missed a lot. And it's simply because of, of people messing the signs up. So get your equation sheet and make sure that you know what each of these variables means and what makes them positive or negative. This does not mean that you're always going to have a negative in the bottom. Uh, if the velocity of the source is negative, then this thing would be positive. So be careful when you put your stuff in. What is the Doppler frequency? That would be the F prime of a 211 hertz sound. So that's the actual frequency. If the source is moving away from a stationary observer at 45 meters per second, uh, use 345 for the speed of sound. So the Doppler frequency would be the velocity of the sound wave, which is 345, plus the velocity of the observer, and the observer is stationary. And uh, then the speed of sound, 345, minus the velocity of the source. And the source is 45. And so 345 divided by 300. 345 times the frequency. Forgot about that part. Times the original frequency. So 345 times what was the original for 211. So 345 divided by 300 and then times 211 gives me 242.7. And there you go. Be real careful about what goes where. On your equation sheet, make it very clear where the velocity of the observer and the velocity of the source go. Um, this should not be an, a question that's missed often, but it is. A particle has a force of 10 newtons applied to it back toward the equilibrium position. When it vibrates, at 0.331 meters. What is the Hooke's Law constant for that particle? F equals minus kx. And so if we're looking for the constant k, that's going to be, uh, I really don't need to worry about the sign um, on this one. K is F over X. And so we have 10 newtons divided by 0 0.331 meters divided by 0 0.331 gives us 30.2. And okay, the negative sign here. Uh, if it asks for direction, if it asks for the displacement or the force, then you might have to worry about that. But if they're asking for the constant, the constant's always positive, so you don't have to worry about it. How much power is necessary to produce a sound wave with an intensity of <coughs> 3 3.16 watts per meter squared? So that's watts per meter squared when the wave front is vibrating uh, in an area of 1.69 meters squared. Now, if you don't remember the formula, look at these units. How much power? So we're looking for watts. I have watts per meter squared here. What can I do with a meter squared uh, to get plain old watts? Well, if I multiply by meter squared, do you see that they'll cancel and I'm left with watts? So for this one, I multiply 3.16 watts per meter squared by 1.69 meters squared. 
Uh, so use your units like that. It's called dimensional analysis. 3.16 times 1.69 is 5.34. 5.34. There we go. Okay. The wave takes 3.5 seconds to complete eight oscillations. What's the period? Okay, remember period is the time for one. So seconds per oscillation. So if I do 3.5 seconds divided by eight oscillations, 3.5 divided by eight, I get 0.438 um, seconds. So there's our period. A string that is 0.1 meters long has a bob with mass 2.3 kilograms placed on it. It is allowed to swing so the amplitude is 0 0.0250 meters. What's the period of oscillation? So this, whoop, this one is um, on your ex uh, equation sheet. And period is 2 pi times the square root of mass divided by the spring constant. Um, um, but that's not the way equation when I just want to use this one. It's a pendulum. So that, that's not a mass on a spring, it's a string. So basically we have just a pendulum here that's going to swing. Okay, so the period is equal to 2 pi square root of the length over gravitational acceleration. So that's 2 pi times the square root of uh, 0 0.1 meters over 9.8. We don't care about the amplitude and we don't care about the mass. So 0.1 divided by 9.8 equals the square root of that times 2 times 3.14 is 0 0.634 seconds. A 6 kilogram pendulum bob is placed on a 10 meter long string pulled back 5 degrees which is the period of the pendulum when released. Again, we don't care about that. We don't care about that because the period is 2 pi square root of L over G. Um, and uh, I'm not going to work this out all the way, just plug the numbers in like you did there. Uh, if a mass on a pendulum were taken to the moon, where the acceleration to gravity is much smaller, the period of oscillation would, well, look at the formula. If I'm on the moon and this gets smaller, uh, even if it's under a radical, having something in the denominator of, of a fraction get small means the value of a of the whole would get larger, and so the period would increase. Um, putting two pendulum problems, I probably meant to do a period of a spring here, a mass on a spring. Mark that formula on your equation sheet. Uh, it's got mass and the spring constant uh, under the radical where this one has length and gravitational acceleration. So make sure you know where those, those are on your equation sheet. <clears throat> excuse me, when we're talking about mirrors and lenses, you're going to have to do um, problems with the thin lens or thin, well, it's called the thin lens equation, but it works for both, <coughs> and magnification. Some of the most important parts uh, are getting the signs right. There's nothing difficult about these problems, but the reason some of them are not only most missed on these tests, but most missed like out of all the problems that there are, is because people don't pay attention to the signs that, um, for focal length, that uh, some of the mirrors and lenses have. So be aware that if you have a concave mirror, and that's a mirror that is shaped like this when the light comes that way, the focal length is positive. But if you have a convex mirror, that's a mirror that's shaped like this with the light coming from here, then the focal length is negative. For lenses, if it's a converging lens that looks like this, the um, focal length is positive, but if it's a diverging lens that looks like that, then the focal length is negative. Uh, and you can look at, at this chart for object distance and image, image distance. Uh, if the object is in front of the mirror, uh, then the object, is, object distance is always positive. It's never, ever, ever going to be negative. Image distance might be negative if the image is behind the mirror. So 
Uh, in the case of a convex mirror, you often have an, a virtual image that's behind the mirror and its image distance would be negative. Uh, if for a, um, a lens, if the image is formed to the left of the lens, so uh, if light comes through here and makes an image on this side, the image distance is positive. But if you have a lens that creates an image, a virtual image on this side, uh, then the image distance is negative. Usually that comes out when you solve them. But the focal length, often you have to plug it in and you're not told that it's negative in the, in the problem. So just know that for a diverging lens or a convex mirror, the focal length is negative. Um, if you have a mirror and a ray hits the vertex, it'll bounce off so that the angle of incidence and the angle of reflection are the same. Uh, when you have a lens, uh, anything that's the, a light ray that comes in parallel to the principal axis will be refracted through the focal point. And a light ray that goes through the vertex uh, will not be refracted, It'll, whether, no matter which type of lens it is. Uh, a light going, uh, ray coming through that center of the, of the lens will not be refracted. So let's go on and look at some of the questions. Okay, a five centimeter tall object, so that is the image height, is placed three centimeters from a lens. That is the object distance. No, I'm sorry. This is the object height. The object distance from a lens produces an image that is 4.25 centimeters behind the lens. So there's our image distance. What's the magnification? Magnification is negative di over do. So the magnification, if it's a lens and the image is back here, then uh, it is an inverted image, it's a real image, uh, and the magnification will be negative. So the magnification is negative di, 4.25 over do. So 4.25 over 3 is 1.42 and uh, negative. Okay, so it's a, the image is enlarged. Notice if the image, um, the, if it's, if magnification is bigger, if the magnitude is bigger than one, then it's an enlarged image. If it's upside down, uh, the magnification is negative. It's a real image if it's upside down. A 10 centimeter tall object, so that is object height, is placed 8 centimeters, so that is object distance, in front of a curved mirror that produces an image 6 centimeters in front of, okay, so you have a mirror, and here's your principal axis, and the light's coming in and the image is out here. So that is going to be a real image. It'll be, uh, uh, yeah, a real image where, yes, so it'll be upside down. Um, six centimeters in front of the mirror, that is the uh, image distance. And so the focal length, 1 over F is 1 over DI, 1 over DO. So 1 over F is 1 over, and you can use centimeters or make, just be consistent, 6 plus 8. If I use my calculator, um, the inverse of 6 plus the inverse of 8. Okay, so this gives me that 1 over the focal length is 0 0.292, and then you take the inverse of that, and get 3.42. And the focal length has units, so it's centimeters. A 10 centimeter tall object is placed 8 centimeters in front of a curved mirror to produce an image behind the mirror. So the image behind the mirror is um, the image distance is going to be negative and um, so let's see, 10 centimeter tall, again that's HO, and this is DO, and 6 centimeters behind the image, so the image height is going to be, I mean image distance is going to be negative 6 centimeters when we plug it in. So 1 over F equals 1 over DI plus 1 over DO, 1 over F is 1 over 
negative 6 plus 1 over 8. So the inverse of 6 again, but it's going to be um, negative 0 0.167 plus the inverse of 8, 0 0.125. Hold on just a second. Okay, so that gives me 0, negative 0 0.042. I'm going to take the inverse of that, negative 23.8 centimeters. I'm going to double check my math. Yeah, I got negative 24 the second time I did it. Um, this is, there was some round off error there. Okay, so be really careful. See, it didn't tell you uh, to make the image distance negative. It just said it's behind the mirror. And so, um, like in that table, the image distance is negative if, it, if the image is behind a mirror. The image distance is positive if the image is in front of the mirror. So you might want to, you know, I might, if I were taking this test, I might would have that chart printed out and have it beside me. Uh, these are some of the most missed questions of all, and it's all about those sign conventions. A five centimeter tall object, that's object height, is placed in front of a concave mirror. So we have a, con a mirror that's shaped like this, um, and the focal length is three centimeters. An image is produced uh, 4.5 centimeters behind the mirror. So this is image distance behind the mirror. And remember, if an object is, if the image is behind the mirror, then the image distance is negative. So the image is negative 4.5 centimeters. Now what I'm going to look up real quick is if I have a concave mirror, is the focal length positive or negative? This is why I told you that if I were you, I'd print that chart out. Focal length spherical mirror, concave mirror, it's positive, convex mirror, it's negative. Okay, so I have a concave mirror, and so the focal length is positive. Good. How far is the object from the mirror? So we're looking for object distance. 1 over f is 1 over di plus 1 over do. So 1 over do is going to be 1 over f minus 1 over di. 1 over do is 1 over 3 minus 1 over negative 4.5. So uh, notice these two are negative and they're going to make a plus. So 3 1 over plus 4.5 equals then 1 over that. And I get 1.8 centimeters. And I Put that there just in case to make sure that I got all my signs right. Uh, they're tricky, but they're the most missed questions of all, not just on this test, but of all, like all of the ones on the exam. And it's all about the signs. What is the magnification of a curved mirror if a 10 centimeter tall object, so the object height is 10 centimeters, is placed 8 centimeters from the mirror, so the object distance is 8 centimeters and produces an image 4 centimeters behind the mirror. So 4 centimeters behind, behind the mirror. So if it's a mirror and the image is back here, then the image distance is negative. So the image distance is negative 4. And magnification is negative di over do. So that's negative, negative 4 over 8 is 0 0.5. Again, I'll put the answer there just to check myself and it's right. Okay, look over some ray diagrams. They're just not hard and you're not going to have to draw them yourself, you're just going to have to complete them. Um, real and virtual images. Virtual images are always right side up. They are on the negative side of a lens or a mirror. Uh, meaning they're on the left-hand side of a lens or on the right-hand side of a mirror. 
they have a positive magnification because they're right side up. Um, and they are produced by an imaginary intersection of rays where your eye thinks the rays are intersection, intersecting and the light's coming from there. Real images are always upside down. They're on the positive side. So if it's a lens, this is the real side or the positive side. If it's a mirror, the real side is the, the, the reflection side, the, side, the left-hand side. Uh, um, they have a negative magnification because they're upside down and they're produced like where light rays actually intersect. So if you were going to complete these, it's a diverging lens, a ray that uh, aims at the focal point will be refracted parallel to the principal axis. This is a converging lens, a ray uh, that has come through the focal length will be refracted parallel to the principal axis. A ray that is parallel to the principal axis will be refracted through the focal length. It should go through that point, through the focal length on that side. For mirrors, uh, a ray that is, that is parallel to the principal axis will reflect through the focal point. A ray through the focal point will reflect parallel to the principal axis. A ray that is perpendicular to it hits like aims at the focal point will be reflected parallel to the principal axis. So it aims at the focal point, but it, it's a mirror, so it's going to reflect towards the focal point, refract reflected uh, parallel to the principal axis. Parallel to the principal axis, it will be in this case, it, these are similar, but this is a con cave mirror and this is convex, it will diverge in a direction, it'll go this way, but you can find it by laying a ruler down here and it will be refracted away from the focal point. So if you lay a ruler down along there, you could that should be a straight line, it's not exactly straight. And this, uh, oh this is a plane mirror. And if it's a plane mirror, and this is a normal line, it'll be reflected such that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. And that's what, that little dotted line is normal, perpendicular to the mirror. So it'll be reflected with equal angles around that line. Uh, using the wave equation, remember the velocity of any wave is its frequency times its wavelength. Uh, a wave travels at 9.06 meters per second with a frequency of 22.8 hertz. What's the wavelength? Well, if velocity is frequency times wavelength, wavelength is equal to velocity divided by frequency. In this problem, that would be 9.06 divided by 22.8. 9.06 divided by 22.8 equals 0 0.397, 0 0.397 meters. What is the frequency of a photon? Uh, it's a photon of light, electromagnetic radiation, and the speed of light is 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second. So um, that's what you put in for velocity. Uh, frequency is equal to velocity divided by wavelength. So 3 times 10 to the 8 meters per second divided by the wavelength, which is 6.43 times 10 to the second meters. So 3 times 10 to the 8 divided by 6.43 times 10 to the second. This is a big number. Um, hertz. And uh, probably since we have three significant figures, I would probably say four, six, six, zero, zero, zero hertz. And round it that way, or four, six, seven, I guess. If that's a five, then that would round to four, six, seven. Now this is multiple choice, and so you're going to just gonna look for the one that's closest. Um, yeah, this the this was big, and it bothered me. But that's a times ten to the eighth, and it's times ten to the second. So we're left with a times ten to the sixth with that, and this is about a half, 3 over 6.4, so I'm okay with that. What is the index of refraction of the substance at the critical angle 
is 69.3 degrees going from some substance. Okay, so that we're looking for N1. So it's going some from some substance into water. And so that's N2. And this is Snell's law at the critical angle, says that the sine of the critical angle, so sine of 69.3, is equal to N2, 1.33, over N1. And we're looking for N1. So N1, we've got a, it's 1.33 divided by the sine of 69.3, 1.33 divided by 69.3 sine. Equals 1.42, and there's no unit on our index of refraction. Um, when a ray slows down as it crosses into a boundary between media, the ray will bend closer to the normal. So, if this is my slow medium, I'm mean, sorry. If this is my fast medium, and this is my slow medium, and light comes in at an angle, this is my normal line that ray will be bent towards the normal. So it'll be, this line will be closer to it than if it had just gone straight. What is the index of refraction of the second medium if a ray makes an angle of 41.3 in flint glass, so that's N1, What is the index of refraction? This is N2, N1, N flint makes an angle. Okay, so here's our normal line. So the incident angle is 41.3. Um, this is a confusing question. What is the index of refraction of the second medium? So we're looking for N2. If the ray makes an angle of 41, okay, so the incident angle theta 1 is 41.3, and the refracted angle is 45 degrees. And so N1 sine theta 1 equals N2 sine theta 2, and so N2 will be equal to N1 sine theta 1 over sine theta 2. Okay, so N2 will be equal to, okay, sine of theta 1, 41.3 sine times N1 is 1.65, so I get a 1. 9 in the numerator and theta 2 is 45 degrees and the sine of 45 degrees is 0 0.707 so 1.09 divided by 0 0.707 equals 1.54 okay what is the angle of refraction if a ray makes an angle of 25 degrees with a normal in air as it travels into flint glass. And so here's the normal. So the ray comes like this, and this is air, n equals 1. And uh, it travels into flint glass where n equals 1.65. So it will be bent toward the normal. So this is our 25 degree angle, and we're looking for that angle. So n1 sine theta 1 equals n2 sine theta 2, and we're looking for sine theta 2 is n1 sine theta 1 over n2. So n1 is 1, sine theta 1, sine of 25 is 0.4226 over n2. Is 1.65. Okay, so what I get there is 0 0.256, but that's the sine of theta 2. 
So I'm going to do the inverse sine of 0 0.256. And I get 14.8 degrees. Young's double slit diffraction have, will probably have a couple of questions on it. This equation is on your equation sheet, but be careful. Um, M is 1, 2, 3 for if you're looking for a bright fringe. But if you're looking for a dark fringe, like this question asks, then you're going to add a half to it. So if you're looking for the second order dark fringe, here you're not going to put two, you're going to put two and a half. Uh, how far apart? So we're looking for D, and D is equal to M plus one half, because we're looking for a dark fringe, times lambda divided by sine theta. So looking for the second order dark fringe, so it would be two and a half times our wavelength, 6.7 times 10 to the minus seventh divided by the sine of our angle of 1.83. And so let's see, 2.5 times 6.7 times 10 to the minus seventh equals, and then divide that by equals, and I get, and I get, do scientific notation for this, 5.25 times 10 to the minus 5th meters. Now, just so you know, um, if uh, this is symmetric around a line here. So this is what you would see on a wall if you had, um, you know, your light source over here and you had your double slit here. This is what would show up on the wall over here. And you have a center, central bright and dark areas. So you have a central bright area and then you have um, dark to either side and then you have the fringes. So C marks the first order bright fringe, and D marks the first order dark fringe, and E marks the second order bright fringe, and F would mark the second order dark fringe. 